Romans chapter 2. And you remember, remember last week, we looked at um, the second half of Romans chapter 1. And we saw there were some things that we needed to see clearly there in Romans chapter 1. Paul talks about how it's evident, it's very clear that there is a creator. And so man is without excuse. And so the wickedness of man and the fallen nature of man and all of the things that we see in society uh, that just kind of, you know, just kind of turn our stomach and just we're able to look at and say that that's terrible. And what's interesting about that is that, you know, it's at varying degrees. You know, we always find someone who's a worse sinner than us. You know what I mean? But what Paul is saying is that when you're seeing that, that is evidence that society has fallen away from God. That is evidence uh, that, um, in, in truth, we need a Savior. And so we looked at um, some things that we needed, needed to see clearly last week. Uh, clearly, there is a God. Clearly, man has rejected God. And clearly... Society has fallen. And then in light of all those things, excuse me just a moment. In light of all those things, we see that clearly we need a savior. Clearly, we need a Savior. And so we pick up where we left off last week. And I want you to look, if you will, at Romans chapter 1, so we can get a running start, starting in verse 32. Because chapter 2 builds upon what we first read at the beginning of the book of Romans. So verse 32 of chapter 1 says, Who knowing the judgment of God, and if you just look up a few, up a few more verses, just to get, to get that list of all of the debauchery of man and the, the wickedness and how we can see these things that just aren't nice, uh, unrighteousness, fornication, wickedness, covetousness. It start, the list starts up in verse 29 and continues on uh, coming right down. And then verse 32 declares, who knowing the judgment of God, that they which commit such things are worthy of death, not only do the same, but have pleasure in them that do them. Now, at this point in the book of Romans, you know, the, the Christians there in Rome that he is giving this doctrinal treatise, treatise to, uh, as they heard all of those horrible things, and even as you hear all those things, you might be tempted to go, yeah, yeah, yeah. Them people, real wicked. Those people are real terrible. Yeah, that's that's the bad stuff. Kind of like we do when we read the paper, you know what I mean? We say, can you believe that? Oh, my goodness. Did you see that? And then Paul starts hitting in chapter 2, verse 1. Then he says, therefore, thou art inexcusable, O man. Whosoever thou art that judgest, for wherein thou judgest another, thou condemnest thyself, for thou that judgest doest the same things. So he paints that picture. You can almost sense the reader, the audience, saying, yeah, 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 those people are terrible. And then he flips the tables 
on us and he says yeah and you're just as wicked you're just as evil and so as we look at this first half of chapter two i submit to you this you must not judge you must not judge let's pray father we thank you for your word father again i thank you specifically for these pages of scripture the book of romans father it was these pages that as i kneeled by my mother's bed and she showed me your way of salvation that i looked upon the words from romans that i was able to understand that i myself am a sinner and that i need you to save me and so father i thank you for this book and Father, as we go through this book, Father, I pray that you would speak to our hearts. Father, it's so easy for us to look at the wickedness and the terrible things in the world and to find things that uh, seem more wicked than us and somehow to make ourselves feel better by pointing out those things that are, as we feel, further gone than we are. But Father, help us. Help us to understand today that we have all sinned and father that we need your way of salvation oh father i pray that you would speak to us through your word today we pray this in jesus name amen so you must not judge you know i'm, I'm sure probably you've all heard the saying when you point your finger at someone else you've heard this before when you point your finger at someone else you have three fingers pointing back at you as i was doing the research for this i came across one that said you have four fingers pointing back i'm like i think that person's a little confused i'm trying to figure out how it was they holding their hand but but uh yeah you know when you point your finger at someone hey you you should when you do that you have three that are pointing back at you and this has become a, you know a saying and, and we hear it often and i submit to you the reason why it's so popular is because of exactly what Paul is saying here in Romans chapter 2. It's like uh, fallen man likes to point the finger and accuse others, but yet at the same time while we're doing that, we have a whole plethora of problems that we should be dealing with ourselves. And so what Paul is showing us here is that fallen man but we, we are in no condition to point the finger and judge other people. Now, I want to say this. A lot of times, this passage and the one over in Matthew's, judge not that you be not judged, I think it's Matthew, a lot of times it is misused. And people say, oh, you can't judge me. So, for instance, when someone brings up something that is clearly in the Word of God, right? Someone says, you can't judge me, you can't judge me. I, I think we need to make a distinction. Of course, whenever we bring up the things that are in Scripture, we have to have the right attitude, right? But, but understand, there are things in Scripture that are spoken of as sin, and we need to, in grace and in love, I mean, the book of Galatians talks about this, uh, help others in that area too. But it has to be with the right attitude so often it is not and that is what paul is saying here if if you're talking about sin with this haughtiness and this idea that you've got it all settled if you, you've got this arrogance about the way that you talk about it no, you, you're 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 in the wrong uh, that is not the way that things are to be approached and that's where this saying comes from because so often that is what happens someone very hard pointing, telling someone what they need to fix, and yet at the same time, all of these problems that that very person has. Man in his fallen condition is quick to point out the problems of other, others, while at the same time having a whole host of his own problems. There's an ancient legend that says every man is born into the world with two bags suspended from his neck. So get this picture in your mind. Every man's born into the world, two bags, one bag here, and then the other bag 
on the other side, a bag here and a bag there. The bag in front of his neck is full of his neighbor's faults. The bag behind his neck is filled with his own faults. And isn't that so true? Oftentimes, that's how we are. We're able to see crystal clear all everybody else's problems. But when it comes to our problem, well, we'll always have an excuse for those kinds of problems. Thomas Akempis said, how rarely we weigh our neighbor in the same balance in which we weigh ourselves. You must not judge. And here in Romans 2, we get several reasons why we should not judge and what that results in. First of all, when we judge, and I just want to say there's a difference between us judging and us showing what God has judged. That's the difference. And I think that's the difference when people say, you can't judge me, you can't tell me. I know, but if, if God has clearly said something is wrong and we in humility show this is God's position, then that is not the same as us judging. That's God judging, right? But again, it has to be done with the right spirit. If there's a haughtiness and there's a, a, a this, uh, if you project this idea that you've got it all together and, and, and the other person that you're talking to uh, is the one that has all the problems, well, then you're doing exactly what Paul is talking about here. So we shouldn't judge in that regard because, number one, it brings condemnation. It brings condemnation. Look at verse 1 once again of chapter 2. Therefore thou art inexcusable, O man, whosoever thou art that judgest, for wherein thou judgest another, thou condemnest thyself, for thou that judgest doest the same things. So we shouldn't judge because it brings condemnation upon us from the enduring word commentary. David Guzik says, as we judge another person, we point to a standard outside of ourselves, And that standard condemns everyone. So that's why we, we need to be careful. That standard condemns everyone, not only the obvious sinner. Andrew Murray, commentator from old time, said, Since you know the justice of God, as evidenced by the fact that you are judging others, you are without an excuse. Because in the very act of judging, you have condemned yourself. You see, we shouldn't judge because it brings condemnation. It shows that we know there's an outside standard beyond ourselves. It brings condemnation. C.S. Lewis, speaking of this standard outside of ourself, if you've ever, ever read Mere Christianity, uh, C.S. Lewis takes a, a very uh, intelligent approach to reasoning as to why what the Bible says about man and sin and salvation is correct. And in mere Christianity, he points this out. He says, everyone has heard people quarreling. Sometimes it sounds funny, and sometimes it sounds merely unpleasant. But however it sounds, I believe we can learn something very important from listening to the kind of things they say. Have you ever heard people arguing back and forth? <laughs> right? There's a lot to be learned from the things that people say when they argue. He says they say things like, how'd you like it if anyone did the same to you? Hey, that's my seat. I was there first. Hey, leave him alone. He isn't doing you any harm. Why should you shove in first? Hey, give me a bit of your orange. I gave you a bit of mine. Come on, you promise. These are the kind of things that we hear as people argue. He says people say things like that every day. Educated people as well as uneducated. And children as well as grown-ups. C.S. Lewis says, now what interests me about all these remarks is that the man who makes them is not merely saying what the other man's behavior does, uh, what that the other man's behavior does not happen to please him. He's not just saying, I don't like the way you're acting. The way that it is worded, he says, he is appealing to some kind of standard or behavior which he expects the other man to already know about. 
And the other man very seldom replies, well, I don't care, or to hell with your standard. I'm quoting C.S. Lewis, all right? All right. I, I, he doesn't reply, I don't know about, you know, I don't care about your uh, standard. C.S. Lewis says nearly always he tries to make out that what he has been doing does not really go against the standard, or that if it does, there's some type of special excuse. He pretends there's some special reason in this particular case why the person who took the seat first should not keep it, or that things were quite different when he was given the bit of orange, and that something has turned up which lets him off keeping his promise. C.S. Lewis says it looks, in fact, very much as if both parties had in mind some kind of law or rule of fair play or decent behavior or morality or whatever you like to call it, about which they really agree. And they have, he says. If they had not, they might, of course, fight like animals. But they could not quarrel in the human sense of the word. Quarreling means trying to show that the other man is in the wrong. And there would be no sense in trying to do that unless you and he had some sort of agreement as to what right and wrong so you see, when man judges someone else, we acknowledge that there is a standard outside of ourself that everybody should know and should comply with. So when we judge, we bring condemnation upon ourselves. It brings condemnation. Not only does judging other people bring condemnation upon ourselves, but I want you to look at verse 1 again. There at the end of verse 1, Paul adds, For thou that judgest doest the same things. So not only does it bring condemnation, but it also reveals hypocrisy. It reveals hypocrisy. Now, I think the best illustration that I can give you on this point is from a very, very famous preacher. Very famous preacher. Turn to Matthew 7. Yes, Jesus addresses this the best way that it can be addressed. And it's somewhat comical the way that he addresses this. Matthew 7, verse 1. Earlier, didn't I reference this passage and said I wasn't sure if it was in Matthew? How could I not know that? <laughs> All right, it is in Matthew. Judge not that ye be not judged. For with what judgment ye judge, ye shall be judged. And with what measure ye meet, so in other words, the rule that you use to measure others, it shall be measured to you again. All right, now here, watch this illustration. And why beholdest thou the mote? That is in thy brother's eye, but considerest not the beam that is in thine own eye. Verse 4, or how wilt thou say to thy brother, let me pull out the mote out of thine eye, and behold, a beam is in thine own eye. Thou hypocrite, first cast out the beam out of thine own eye, and then shalt thou see clearly to cast out the mote out of thy brother's eye. I mean, the picture that Jesus paints here is comical, isn't it? I mean, here this guy comes up, and he has a, a, a telephone pole sticking out of his eye, right? <laughs> Swinging it around, yeah? And he, he tells his friend who is over playing with their eye because they've gotten some little speck in. You can't even really see it, but you can feel it, you know? And the guy's trying to get out. And the guy with the telephone pole swinging it around comes over and says, Hey, you've got something in your eye. Let me help you get it out. Ridiculous, isn't it? Jesus says that's what it's like when we judge. Judge not that ye be not judged, he says. For with what judgment ye judge, ye shall be judged. And with what measure ye meet, it shall be measured to you again. A serviceman once wrote about a moment of comedy he had witnessed in the army. It happened during a company inspection at the Redstone Arsenal in Alabama. The inspection was being conducted by a full colonel. Okay, so very important man conducting, looking at the troops. 
examining every little piece on their uniform. Everything had gone smoothly until the officer came to a certain soldier. He looked him up and down and he snapped, Sir, button that pocket, to which the young soldier, a little rattled, stammered, uh, 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 right, right, right now, sir? Of course, right now, said the colonel. Whereupon the soldier very carefully reached up and buttoned the flap on the colonel's uniform. You see, oftentimes we are able to see the problem that someone else has while at the same time we are unkempt. We are not in place. We do not look how we should look. You see, we shouldn't judge because it reveals our own hypocrisy. The best rule is just give lots of grace. Grace, 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 right? It will save you a lot of embarrassment in life. It keeps us from showing um, the things that are wrong with us. So, don't judge. Because when we judge, it reveals hypocrisy. But then lastly, look at verse 3. Back in... Romans chapter 2. So it brings condemnation. And then Paul says, Thou that judgest, you do the same thing. So it reveals hypocrisy. And then if you look at verse 3, he says, And thinkest thou this, O man, that judgest them which do such things, and doest the same, that thou shalt escape the judgment of God. You know, sometimes that is why we like to look at others and find the faults that they have. Sometimes that is why we like to open the newspaper and read about the, the next horrendous thing that some person did and we shake our head and mm -mm -mm, can't believe that. Because if we feel like if we can point to them and their wickedness, well, then certainly we're okay. We're okay because we sure haven't gone that far away. You see, it will give you a false sense of security. And thinkest thou this, O man, that judgest them which do such things, and doest the same, that thou shalt escape the judgment of God. One of my favorite authors is Max Lucado. And in his book, The Grip of Grace, he gives this illustration. He says, suppose God simplified matters and reduced the Bible to one command. Thou must jump so high in the air that you touch the moon. Okay, so just imagine the Bible was reduced to that. All God wants you to do, jump so high that you can touch the moon. He says, no need to love your neighbor or to pray to follow Jesus. Uh, just touch the moon, and by virtue of a jump, you'll be saved. He says, we'd never make it. We'd never make it. Now, there may be a few who jump three or four feet. Mm, that's good. Or even a few who jump five, maybe even six. But compared to the distance that we have to go, the moon, you see, no one really gets that far. Though you may jump six inches higher than I do, he says, it's scarcely reason to boast. He says, now God hasn't called us to touch the moon, but he might as well have. In Matthew 5, 48, he says, Be ye therefore perfect, as your Father which is in heaven is perfect. None of us can meet God's standard. And as a result, none of us deserves to don the robe and stand behind the bench to judge others. Why? Because we aren't good enough. Now, your neighbor may jump six inches and you may jump six feet, but compared to the 230,000 miles that remain, who can boast? The thought of it, he says, is almost comical. We who jump three feet look at the fellow who jumped one inch and say, what a lousy jump. You see, we like to look at the different jumps that people make. And so one person might stand here. 
one person might jump a little higher than the next person. But I want you to think about this. If that was the standard, all we had to do was jump and touch the boot, which we can't. But if that were the standard, I want you to think of it from God's perspective, from the moon looking down. And while we're talking with each other, ooh, look, look how high I jumped. I jumped six inches higher than you, right? From God's perspective, he must be looking down and saying, I really can't see any of you jumping at all. You see, it gives us a false sense of security when we point at others and we judge other people. It gives us this idea that somehow I've jumped higher, somehow I'm closer to God's standard. When the truth of the matter is that we've all sinned and we've all fallen short of the glory of God. We've missed it. We've missed the mark. And so don't judge. It gives a false sense of security. We can't make the jump. We need someone to jump for us. We need a Savior. We need Jesus. Today, you must not judge. It brings condemnation. It reveals hypocrisy. And it gives false security. One last thought today. One of Bob Marley's songs is Don't Judge. Maybe you've heard the song. The lyrics of the song go like this. Who are you to judge me and the life that I live? Well, some of you know it. <laughs> Who are you to judge me in the life that I live? I know that I'm not perfect and that I don't claim to be. So before you point your fingers, be sure your hands are clean. Before you point your fingers, be sure your hands. Some of you know the song. You've heard it before. Before you point your fingers, be sure your hands are clean. You know, he points out the very problem that we have when we judge other people. And that is, none of our hands are clean. You see, that's the problem that we have. All of us have dirty hands. We've all been soiled by sin. Romans 3.10 says, There is none righteous. No, not one. Romans 3.23 says, For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Isaiah 53.6, All we like sheep have gone astray. None of us have clean hands. But there is someone who came and he has clean hands. Those clean hands were nailed to a cross so that you and I could be saved, so that you and I could be made fit to go and spend eternity with God in heaven. And let me ask you this today. Have you recognized your own sinfulness? Do you understand just how bad your own sin is. You know, I remember when I first started Aruka Baptist Church. Um, oftentimes, I would tell everybody, you're a bunch of wicked, no good sinners. I know you don't hear that much in lots of churches, right? You go down to many of the churches today, you're not going to hear that. But it's true. This is what the Bible teaches. Everybody understand that today? You're not good people. None of you. None of you are good, including the one that you're looking at right now. The only goodness that's in, if there's anything good in me, Jesus, that's the only goodness that is in Jimmy Westbrook. Understand this. We are not good. Have you come to that recognition? Or are you one of the people that opens the paper and looks at it and you, you know, see the, some axe murderer or you know, whatever the horrendous thing that someone out there has done, and you're like, huh, nah, I guess I'm not that bad. You see, we are all sinners, all sinners in the eyes of God. 
And even what, you know, what we consider as some little sin, what we consider as some little sin in the eyes of a holy and righteous God is terrible and it's disgusting and it's despicable and it's enough for us to be punished in hell for all of eternity. I, I think sometimes because we are so sinful and because we live among people that are sinful, sometimes we, we start to forget and we don't really understand just how bad sin is because we're around sinners. And so we can do this kind of thing that Paul is talking about where we find a sinner worse than us, you know, and if you're in here and you're a murderer today, you go and you find someone who's murdered three or four people. That you know, that's how we are. That's how that's how humans are. We we will find somebody who's worse than us and we make ourselves feel okay. But what we need to understand today, the the things that you struggle with that you may not feel are that bad, that 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 little lie that you tell, that anger problem you have, that whatever it is that you the, the lust problem that you have. The, whatever the, the issue is that you're hung up on, right? I don't know. I'm trying to throw out some just to help us today. You fill in the blank. You know what your problem is, right? Fill in the blank. We like to make ourselves feel like it's not that bad. But understand that in the eyes of God, in the eyes of God, it is punishable by death in hell for all of eternity. You see, none of our hands are clean, all soiled with sin. But God loves us so much. He stepped out of heaven and he went to the cross and he took the punishment for our sin so that we could spend eternity with him in heaven. Let me ask you today, have you recognized your own sinfulness? And have you accepted God's gift of cleansing? Through Jesus Christ. If you haven't done that, please do so today. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for the book of Romans. Father, help us. Help us not to be arrogant and judgmental. Father, help us not to seek to find people that we're more mired in sin than we are so that we can feel good about ourselves. Father, help us to understand today that we are all sinners and that we are desperately in need of your salvation. And Father, I know many, many of us in here today, we've received your gift of salvation, but Father, help us never get beyond just how miraculous, just how amazing, just how wonderful it is. And Father, help us not forget. Help us not forget just how deep down you had to reach to pull us out of the nastiness of the sin that we were in. Father, I pray. I pray that you would work in our time of invitation. If there's someone here today who's never trusted never trusted in what you've done on the cross to save them. Father, I pray that they might come, that they might be saved today. And then, Father, for those who have trusted you as Savior, Father, help us not to be judgmental, but help us to proclaim a message of love and grace so that people can be brought up out of the muck and mire and sin and so that they can be saved. Father, I pray that you would work in our invitation today. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.